Let's see. Um, all right. So today I guess to give kind of a brief overview of the, the different ways that wild plants can be used. And some of you may already know some of these things, um, but I wanted to kind of start at a, a baseline in case there are folks in the audience that have never um, uh, done some of these things uh, with with plants. So bear with me if you if you know more. And, and also, I would like to say, I don't know everything either. And if you have some great things to share as well, just please jump in. Um, I think everybody would appreciate that. Everybody's got a little bit of uh, something to share, I think. Um, all right, so we'll go presentation mode. So these, this is just a list of some of the different ways that you can use plants and I'll go over each of them. Um, obviously food, um, you know, over the years, uh, people have been almost scared away from using wild plants. And, and just recently there's been kind of a resurgence of that. And um, I hope to demystify those things a little bit. It's not as scary as some people uh, kind of let on, but you do have to be careful and you have to know what you're doing. Um, uh, beverages, obviously that's something that's, you know, that's something that goes back years, of, you know, thousands of years using plants as beverages, um, medicine, obviously the same thing. And then some more modern things, hy hygiene, comfort, clothing, bedding, um, some traditional things, shelter, utility, weapons, uh, craft work and ceremonial items. Um, and so we have food um, that can be eaten raw. There are some things that um, can be upsetting or a little bit toxic if you do eat them raw. And so I do, and I'll probably repeat this several times, you have to know what you're doing or you're, you're learning under somebody that knows what they're doing. Um, so, and I'm thinking particularly of um, like fiddleheads this spring, hopefully some of you part, part, uh, did take part in harvesting some fiddleheads this spring, uh, but oftentimes uh, if you don't blanch those and kind of leach some of the tannins out, they can be upsetting to your stomach. And so those are, you know, that's just an example of something to be aware of when, when you're gathering wild edibles. Um, and, and this is another, so acorns are, uh, uh, another thing that have to be leached, uh, from the tannins. Um, and this is just another example too, where people have been kind of scared away from, from wild foods. Oh, that's, you know, that's toxic. You can't eat. Well, not always. Most of the time, it's just the form that it's in that may be upsetting. And most things aren't going to kill you <laughs> as people have kind of alluded to there are some things but um for the most part things are pretty safe and you just need to know what you're doing um the same with elderberries so this is one um that um sh can be toxic in large large amounts so there's some things that we can process in small amounts that it's not going to bother you it's kind of like green beans from the garden you can eat a few raw but if you eat a pound um there's <laughs> there's chemicals in there that will your stomach will not be happy with um and beverages of course the wines and the beers and the teas so and this is one that probably a lot of us already know about um, but lab tea is, is one that can be found almost year round, um, which makes this one really, really nice. And this um, lab tea is really good for boosting your immunity. Um, so drinking when you have the flu or, or cold or you feel the onset of it is, is really nourishing. Um, juices, obviously, I'm sure we've I think I was in the cooking class where you guys made smoothies, so you know all about that, but we have um, 
all kinds of berries here and and I'll go over that a little bit later in the presentation. Um, so this is one, uh, so hops, uh, that's one thing that um, alcoholic beverages have been made out of. And primarily when this started, it was just for access to something potable because water um, was oftentimes tainted with something that could make you sick. And so um, hops is the main one, but people would make um, beer out of all kinds of different things. Um, yarrow, um, all, all, all kinds of different things. Um, and obviously wine. So I know there's some people in the community that have tried their hands at dandelion wine, um, things like that elderberry wine um the 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 difference is is it just has a little bit more sugars in it for the most part um and it's typically berries but obviously with the dandelion flowers that's um not the case um and medicines um today i will the plants that i go over um they'll be mostly plants that are pretty safe and also abundant um and and that's because i i don't want to promote the the picking of plants that may be a little bit more sensitive or um you might need to know a little bit more about that plant to be able to harvest it sustainably um and i also um want to keep it to general stuff that kind of like universal medicines because they can really be specific for the person and not everything's going to work for everybody um so these medicines can be taken in many different um um ways um dandelion for instance the leaf can be eaten that's a diuretic the root is used for something else um, and, and, um, so you can eat that fresh or dried. A lot of people use the dandelion greens in, in their salads. So when people call them weeds, they, uh, aren't necessarily, uh, you can definitely take advantage of them. Um, unless you have a giant dog like me running around the yard, peeing on everything that's you might want to avoid that <laughs> so just make sure you're picking from you know an area away from the road away from where there could be toxins things that don't have um pesticides or insecticides or something on them um the other thing with dandelions too is they can sometimes be um if you let them go a little bit bitter that's not necessarily a bad thing um americans actually don't get enough bitters in their diets and bitters, the chemicals that make something bitter actually helps with your digestion. And so um, that's not necessarily a bad thing to, to have a, a, a green with, with a bitter taste. Um, you can also take things in capsules. So a lot of people can, you know, you can pick something, dry it, grind it up, stuff it in a capsule and, and take it that way. If you don't like teas or it's just easier to take capsules, um, it's easier to bring with you, um, and just pop in your mouth. Um, pretty convenient. Um, so one of the, the example that I have here is, uh, wild lettuce leaves that, um, is used to treat insomnia. Now, given that, um, I just, the caveat with all of these things is everybody is different. You have a different physiology and not every plant is going to work for everybody. And so to work with somebody that knows what they're doing is important. Um, and tablets or like little, they call them little pastilles. Um, and usually the binder that holds them together is honey, or you could do maple syrup or something like that. Honey is nice because that's antiseptic and it has its own medicinal qualities as well. Uh, one that my friend, um, 
that. Jed, you know, her uh, makes is a slippery elm um, pastille for, um, for sore throats and it's really, really good. Teas, you've probably all familiar with teas. So many, um, many herbs in this area can be used as a tea. It's not gonna have caffeine in it like a traditional tea leaf. Um, but it'll have different medicinal properties. Um, and here we have pictured bearberry. Um, and this is one in this area that I urge to just be mindful about picking because it's only found in specific areas and just to be careful that you're not um, over picking. And in the, uh, I have provided a handout that maybe somebody might put in the, um, in the chat but it does provide this guidance for picking plants. Like you can only pick, the guidance is picking only one in 20. So if there aren't a lot of plants there, don't pick a lot of plants. You want to be able to have that, that plant be sustainable into the future. And, and one that I think about, um, particularly this time of year are wild leeks. Everybody's wild about wild leeks right now. Um, and I've actually came upon a guy just with coming out to a spot that is, you know, it has a lot of plants, but a lot of people pick there and he, um, well, they're highly coveted for the bulbs. So he's digging them all up. Um, and I just encourage people not to do that because you get plenty of flavor out of the leaves, but they take these plants take seven years to reproduce. And so you know, it's kind of like ginseng or something like that. Um, and so if you dig the bulb up, it's not gonna regrow, but if you just cut the leaf off, then it's gonna grow the next year. And so those are the types of things to think about. Um, a decoction is kind of like a tea. It's primarily used for um, more like bark or roots things like that, that it, it, it takes a little bit more energy to draw out the medicinal properties uh, of the plant. And all it is, is instead of steeping like a tea, where you take boiling water and pour it over the leaves and just let it sit, this is actually boiled for a certain amount of time, sometimes 20 minutes, half an hour. Um, and one that I, um, have on here is Joe pieweed um, and the root is used for um, treating kidney stones. And I'm, I'm thinking that's probably why it's called gravel root. So like gravel in your, in your kidneys there. Um, tinctures. So this was one that I was hoping to demonstrate today, but um, I, I didn't have time to prepare. And so maybe we'll have another chance to do something like this. Um, this is kind of my go-to uh, because you end up soaking herbs, whether they're fresh or dry, in a carrier um, that draws out more medicinal properties. And depending on the carrier, it can uh, draw out different properties. Um, some of the different carriers are, um, so oil, uh, glycerin, um, uh, alcohol, and um, apple cider vinegar. Apple cider vinegar is my go-to because it draws out more properties and it's also shelf stable. But you can certainly, if you want to avoid um, alcohol, you can use one of those other uh, menstruums or carriers to be able to draw things out. It may not be as strong and it may not keep as long, but it's still useful. Um, and so here, um, like an alcohol tincture, I would say would take, yeah, it depends on what plant you have. Um, this is two to eight weeks. I would say more than two weeks. Uh, I would say uh, four to eight weeks. 
and especially for an oil as well, it takes a little bit longer for that to infuse. Uh, however, if you are doing an oil infusion to make, uh, say, um, salves or something like that, and you're just trying to extract the fragrance, um, there's a quicker method that can be used in like uh, crock pots to kind of a uh, very low temperature to kind of speed up that process without like boiling off the, the properties that you're trying to uh, retain. Um, and the example that I have here is St. John's wort, um, which is used for treating anxiety. Um, I've also heard that it's good for um, smoking cessation if you're trying to quit smoking um, and, and some other things as well. Syrups, this is a good way to administer medicines to children. Um, and this is, you, you use that decoction me method that I used, or that I mentioned before. Um, and then you add something like glycerin or honey or maple syrup, uh, to make it, uh, sweet. And one of my go-tos is it is an elderberry, uh, an elderberry syrup with some other, um, flavor enhancers and things in there because um that's something that you could almost take every day um as something to kind of stave off uh colds and things in the winter time because elderberry has uh some properties that make it antiviral um, and really boost your immune system and these are things that you can find around here um if you know where to look. Suppositories. Um, this, <laughs> it is what it is, right? Um, so you can make these, they're kind of like pastilles, but obviously use them in a different way and for a different reason. Um, and um, you can, um, and it's not just for digestive issues either. Um, it could just be an alternative method that you want to absorb your medicine, um, if you'd like. And so an example of something other than a digestive, uh, uh something that is an, a digestive is New England Aster. Um, the flowers and its roots, um, are used as a sedative. And lozenges, these are handy in the, the winter months as well. Um, I've made them with uh, actually wintergreen leaves that I found in the area. Um, you could use all, there's different things that you could use that soothe your throat. Um, marshmallow root, um, slippery elm, so this is kind of a convenient way and you, um, after you make them, you coat them in kind of a powdery sugar so they don't uh, stick together. And a, pulse, a poultice, so this is just uh, like a ground up herb that helps either draw out uh, toxins or draw blood to the area to help heal it. Um, things like that. Uh, the one that's pictured here, you might have seen in your yard or something like that. It's plantain. Um, it, this is really handy and, and it actually works better if you make the pulse poultice with your own spit. There's a chemical reaction with the enzymes in your saliva when you chew it up and, and actually use it as a poultice. Of course, you don't have to do it that way um, if you uh, don't find that appealing, but um, it's, it's a nice little side thought. Um, you can make eye washes as well. Um, and they're water-based just to clean your eyes. I've, I know I've heard, I, I think of cottonwood being used that way. Um, but also mountain maple pith and the outer bark. Um, 
to, to treat smoke irritation. Um, and that's just one, there's plenty, plenty of other plants um, for, other, for other eye irritations. Salves are another thing that I make a lot of there. You can make them for all different types of things. Um, and you make them with a decoction or, or uh, an infusion of herbs and oil and then beeswax to kind of um, make that a little more solid and uh, um, able to apply to your skin. Um, and one of the ones that um, my coworkers, I, when I worked at um, resource management, we made a lot was a, was a bug salve uh, with, um, Willow bark, alder bark. So willow bark has a uh basically is acetaminophen. That's kind of what they made it out of. It has this acetosalicylic acid in it. Um, so it's a pain reliever. So, um, and then alder bark and some other things in it that deter uh, mosquitoes. So we'll put the, the willow, the alder, the plantain to help heal, um, and then some other you know, more odorous plants to, to stave off the, the mosquitoes. But that way it's not only used to keep as a repellent, but also to treat um, mosquito bites once you have them. Um, and, and this is really, you can get real fancy and use a real, you know, exact recipe, but it's not necessary. You, it's something that you can kind of eyeball um, you have a liquid that you've infused and then you just add enough beeswax till it gets to the consistency that you, you would like. And that's about it. Creams and lotions. Um, I'll actually, I'm going to hurry up through some of these things so we can get to the plants actually. Um, of course you can make soaps. I know people making, you know, uh, sage, um, sweet grass soaps, um, just for the fragrance, but there are also some that might be, uh, good for your skin. Some people use like what's pictured here is, uh, mullein leaves and flowers, um, are used because they're antibacterial. Cedar soap would be antibacterial, antiviral. Um, so that's handy. You can make shampoos and conditioners. Cedar, a cedar rinse is, was actually kind of a traditional thing, not just as a, as a hair rinse either, but I've heard, um, I know of people that have used it as, um, as a, just an all purpose cleaner and would clean their entire house with, basically like a, a cedar decoction. So conditioners, oh, insect repellent, same as the salve. Um, so tansy flower, this is tansy that's pictured here. Um, we often use that in, in our insect repellent because it smells terrible and it keeps the bugs away. Um, clothing bedding, so obviously, so hemp, uh, is something that is kind of popular right now and having a resurgence. Um, but that is something that can be used as, um, to make cloth for clothing. Um, milkweed is actually a really cool thing. These pods down here at the bottom are milkweed pods. And before there's, um, before they break open and all the seeds disperse, um, they're, they are attached to these filaments. These filaments actually help them kind of float in the, in the air, but those filaments, they're really soft and silky, but they're also really, really, um, uh, uh, they help with insulation. They're really insulative. Um, and I know that they, um, the military actually use them uh, in, I think, I think it was in some kind of swimwear or something to keep uh, to to keep 
um, folks insulated. And it's, I guess, more insulative. It has a higher R value than, than down. Um, it just would take a little bit more time to, to collect. It's kind of tedious. And then cattail does the same thing, the, the powder on the inside. And uh, bedding is another thing. So this is uh, bed straw. Another one that looks like this is cleavers, but they can, I mean, bed straw, obviously it has been used as for, or as like the ticking in, in bedding. Um, it's not something that everybody uses today, but hey, if you're happen to be uh, out in the woods in survival mode and, and you need <laughs> you need a bed, now you, now you know. And obviously shelter, and this has been something that is, you know, people have been using for centuries and, and centuries. Um, so I'll just quickly kind of move through these things. Um, utility weapons, um, snowshoes, lacrosse sticks, um, even these, this is from a, a hawthorn uh, tree and they, the hawthorns have these little, um, spikes on them that have been used for um, different reasons. You could use them like needles to sew or um, or other things. Obviously baskets um, and transportation, um, weapons and craft work. Um, There are also a lot of plants that you can use as dyes. Um, sumac, raspberries, um, there's all types of things that can make all different types of colors. To, so you can utilize these natural dyes. And obviously in tanning, um, so you use plants to use the, the punky wood from, from the alder uh, bush that I mentioned earlier and ceremonial items. So for um, uh, knick-knick, the uh, traditional knick-knick, um, and this is um, of course by, you know, your own personal preference, but you can uh, make a knick-knick with um, red oak or dogwood, um, inner bark, bearberry, um, mullein, I've seen people add wintergreen for taste. Um, and a lot of these things you know, that are added um, actually have medicinal properties um, so that you know it either takes the pain away or reduces anxiety or something of, of that nature. And it's it's not just um, you know, like commercial tobacco with nicotine and everything. It's, it can be medicine if used in the correct way. Um, and ceremonial pipe stems. So most of you know, sumac or ash can be used um, uh, as well. All right. So the next section, I'm just going to dive in and I want to call out um, the Fond du Lac, the language program actually helped um, me gather some of the names of these these plants that we're going to go over today. Hopefully, I don't slaughter uh, the pronunciations. <laughs> I apologize if I do. Wingosh. So uh, sweetgrass, um, we all know and love it uh, dearly, and many of you know you can use it for basketry, ceremonial. Items. I actually, um, I will often make oil tinctures uh, with the sweet grass so I can put it in all different types of things. And I often add it to my homemade deodorant that I make or room and linen sprays. Um, and it keeps really well. Um, and there are people, like I said earlier, that make candles and soap and, and things like that as well. Um, this can be a medicine, but it's one of those that you should use under the advisement of somebody that knows what they're doing. Um, staghorn sumac, buckwanatig. Um, the berries and the roots are useful in this one. 
Um, hopefully you've all been able to try uh, sumac lemonade, but that is delicious. And there are uh, a couple of different methods. Some people uh, use a cold method where they just let it infuse in cold water overnight or for two days or whatever. Um, some people pour boiling water on it. I prefer the cold method because the boiling water leaches out tannins and then it tastes kind of bitter. Um, and I guess I prefer my lemonade more sour. Um, but it, you know, to each your own, if it's not wrong and nothing's going to happen to you if you do it a different way. Um, and dye, obviously, and ceremonial pipe stems. Some people have made wine from a fermented soda. Uh, that's something that I started trying my hand out a few years ago, and that's really interesting. Um, and cough syrup. So, uh, it's been known to to help out uh, the congestion in your in your lungs, um, just like mullen, kind of like an expectorant. Sweet fern, I didn't know the name for that. Um, this one is kind of hard to find, at least on the reservation. I've only found it in one place, uh, but it's amazing if you find it. Um, it's pretty cool. It smells amazing. Uh, this is one thing that we put in our, our insect repellent because it kind of smells like citronella and it's real sticky. The leaves are really sticky. Um, some people have put this in their knick-knick. Um, it has kind of a lemony flavor, um, but it's also really medicinal. It, um, it has something in it called brutin, which has just recently been proven to help in different kinds of cancer treatments. Um, so this is this is really cool. It really um, it grows in more sandier soil areas, um, and I think you can find it more readily outside of the reservation. But um, if you come across it, uh, that's a treat. Wild rose, this is going to be coming up. Uh, this is uh, wild rose petals or something that I like to pick every year um, and make different things with it. Um, I'll pick the petals in, you know, in the summertime um, and make a syrup out of it, which is delicious. Um, you can use it like on plain yogurt or ice cream. I've made, um, like infused it with wild blueberries. I made a cheesecake out of it, but then you can make, um, you know, uh, hygiene things with it too. So both the petals and the fruits are really high in vitamin C, which is really good for your skin, um, for, um, sun damage and, and things like that. And so, um, making, like I've made different like vitamin C serums for under your eyes and different facial lotions um, with that. And it's, it's really nice and it smells pretty good too. So we have uh, willow, this is uh, something that I mentioned earlier. Um, so the, the the inner bark of the willow has those medicinal pro properties that I talked about, um, the pain relieving properties, and so uh, it has been used in knick-knick, and um, you can use it readily in a tea, a decoction. Um, obviously, you can make things from it because it's so flexible. Basketry, walking sticks out of the the larger uh, trees, dream catchers. Um, but also you can use it as a rooting solution. So if you're looking for a rooting solution in your garden endeavors, you can take willow and soak it in a bucket of water for a few weeks and a chemical called, called oxen actually leaches out of, uh, the willow and you can pour that over your plants and it helps, um, helps them grow, establish their root systems, or you can actually root, you know, plants in there um, before you, before you plant. Um, 
it's pretty cool. It's one of it's one of the plants that I know around here that you can just cut a branch off of a plant and just stick it in the ground, make sure it's watered and it'll grow <laughs> without having to root it or anything. Um, it's it's pretty neat. Red Osher dogwood. Uh, this is I mentioned for um, something in Knicknick. Um, it has the same properties. It's in kind of the same plant family. Um, so it has that acetosalicylic acid in it that helps with pain relief. Um, but the same things you can use it. It's very flexible. So you can use with basketry and um, dream catchers. Um, we use it in our salves and um, drink it as a tea or or a decoction. Uh, Akamak or black ash. Um, this one's pretty cool. It's really sad that we have emerald ash borer, um, you know, sweeping across across the nation, taking all of our ash with it. Um, but you can use the um, basically the inner bark or the strips to make baskets um you can use the bark for ceremonial pipe stems snowshoes the um and lacrosse sticks so the nice thing about this wood is it um it's really light but it's really dense um so you have that strength uh without you know of an oak or something without it being that heavy and that's why we use them for uh snowshoes and, and things like that um and the the seeds are actually edible so the seeds are actually they call them keys but they're kind of like a maple seed where they you know like look like a helicopter but you can um just like maple seeds are edible you can you can eat those you can preserve them like pickles there's some people that pickle them and just kind of sprinkle them in salads or something like that basswood or wigu this one's really cool um you can use pretty much every part of this the leaves the flowers nuts inner bark and the twigs so you can um you can make a tea out of the inner bark um and the twigs you can make rope out of the inner bark of uh, a young basswood um the leaves are edible I they're like wild salad if you get them very the leaves when they just come out and they're young and fresh um, they're really mild tasting and delicious um, and the flowers are edible too if you ever want to collect those little tiny things but um, I really like linden flower tea or decoction that's one of my favorites if you like something flowery but kind of with a a woodsy edge it's it's good and it makes me feel good Ajitimuano, yarrow this one's pretty cool if you don't know this you should get to know yarrow um meet your friend it'll save you uh it's antiseptic uh but it also helps stop bleeding or it can help move your blood and circulate your blood in, in um, a place that you need. Um, so where you have bruising or, or things like that, but you can actually take some of the leaves, chew them up if that's the way that you wanna do it and stick them on a wound and it will help stop the bleeding and also help um, keep it from getting infected. Um, if you don't like that, you can make a tincture or a salve out of it with with a with an oil and and just topically apply it. You can also make mouthwash with it. So the other thing, the nice thing with um, yarrow is it's not just um, antiseptic; uh, it's also astringent, so it tightens your skin, so it helps with gum issues um but you can because it's astringent you can also use it like a facial toner 
and it helps kind of tighten your skin and, and stuff like that. Um, and this is something that, like I said, we use in the in, um, insect repellent because it, it helps with those bites once you have gotten bitten. So the after bite type of application. Gijic cedar, um, we all probably know, but um, you can use the leaves, the boughs, the wood um, for crafts. It's really good cough syrup. Um, it's really high in vitamin C. Ever, um, and, and so you can use it as a tea or an herb and a spice. You have to be careful with cedar. It does have a, a, a property in it that is not good for you if taken for long term. Um, and so this is something where you don't want to drink it every single day. I think it's bad for your kidneys if you do do that. But it's fine if, say, you're starting to feel sick or you just want to rev up your immune system for the winter time um, or trying to treat, you know, once you do get sick. But certainly, um, unless you want to have complications, um, don't drink it every single day. Um, one thing that I like to use it in, which is kind of unconventional, is I grind it up with sugar and I make shortbread cookies out of it and they are delicious. Um, so give that a try if you ever feel like it. Mix it with a little um, like orange peel or something. It's pretty nice. And, and um, you, this is one, if you just like the fragrance, infuse it in oil and, and make, you know, um, a salve or, or a, a spray or something out of jingo spruce. Um, this is used uh, pretty much the same. So the spruces and the pines and the um, cedar all have pretty similar properties and where they're antiseptic, high in vi vitamin C. Um, this tastes a little better than cedar though. So <laughs> if you just eat, so I pick the, um, the fresh buds, the, the spruce buds in the springtime um, and pickle those and they kind of taste like um, capers, sprinkle them on salad or fish or something like that. It's really good. And you know, there are um, sustainable practices that you should keep in mind when you do something like this. When you approach, you know, your your spruce friend, um, don't pillage every single bud on, on one tree. Uh, you want to be respectful of, you know, their life and their growth and just pick a little from um, many trees so that you're not hindering their growth. Um, and this, uh, the, the roots of the spruce tree are often used as cordage. Um, so, uh, tea as well, like I said, is high in vitamin C. So similarly to cedar, you can drink that if you're feeling sick or you feel like something's coming on. Um, white, uh, spruce vinegar, that's something that's really good if you like that Little, a little bit of pine flavor and, and stuff. It's, it's pretty tasty. As well as pine. Um, I had a white pine vinegar that um, my friend Shannon makes and it's delicious. Use it in a salad or something like that. Um, but this is used exactly the same, you know, very similarly to the others as well. And balsam fir. Same thing. Um, the nice thing with the balsam fir too is the, um, the, the sap that you can, the resin that you can um, get from them sometimes. And, um, and uh, that's really antiseptic and you kind of use it like liquid Band-Aid or traditionally people used to use it for chewing gum and which actually helped keep people's teeth clean because of the antiseptic properties. So um, mullein is a really good um, 
plant for um, lungs um, and being an expectorant. Um, this picture here of Mullen actually has it with it flowering, which sometimes you want the flowers. Sometimes though, you only want the leaves, the, the basil leaves, they call them, that are on the ground from the first year. So this plant blooms like it'll grow one year and then the next year it will bloom. You wanna get the basil leaves the first year, typically. Um, they are just more potent because they haven't put all their energy into putting that uh, flower stock up. Um, and I mentioned all of the, these things before, teas, herbal infusion, tinctures, knick-knick. Um, Hawthorne's really good for your heart. It's high in vitamin C. Again, um, people have made vinegar, uh, honey syrup. Um, I like I like to just use the berries and tea sometimes to give something a little, uh, make my tea a little bit tart or, um, and for the heart health factor. So the Hawthorne's really good for your heart. Um, and I'll just keep moving along quickly because I know we're almost out of time. So birch, wonderful. Um, obviously you can use the bark um, and the sap. If you haven't tried birch syrup sap, it's much different than um, maple syrup. And birch actually have some different medicinal qualities themselves. Um, which which is it's really good and actually gets transformed even more so and concentrated in uh, the mushroom that or the fungus that grows on them uh, called chaga. Um, chaga is wonderful, but in my presentation or in, in my life, I like to tell people to be respectful of the chaga. It is a very powerful uh, medicine. And so we should leave it for those people that really need it. Um, and not to just take every chunk of chaga that you see <laughs> and just, um, um, yes, save it for the people that really need it for things like cancer, um, and things like that. Uh, also because it takes a long time for those chaga conks to grow and to be respectful of that um, and mindful. And, but you can do, um, you can make tinctures out of the chaga to actually draw more of the medicinal properties out of it and make a tea. You can do actually both because water and alcohol draw out different things. Um, but yes, be mindful and respectful. All the berries. Um, you know, one thing that we typically think of is the blueberries and the raspberries, but there's all kinds of stuff out there. Uh, the gooseberries and currants and all, all kinds of things. We just gotta put our swamp boots on and get out there and smack some mosquitoes. Um, <laughs> I encourage people all the time to get out to, uh, to wetlands because there's some amazing things out there. And here are some others as well, the elderberries and the choke cherries, pin cherries, June berries, high bush cranberries, all of these berries are high in vitamin C's and really C and really, really good for you. And you can make pies and cakes and jellies and syrup and all kinds of things out of them. And these are just a, a few other things that I threw in. I mentioned the wild leeks and the ostrich ferns. Um, milkweed shoot, shoots and pods are actually edible. The leaves are not. Um, so milkweed is the picture on the bottom right hand. Um, so the leaves there are actually pretty toxic. Um, so don't eat those. Um, but the pods are actually before they, um, before they get all the, the fluff on the inside, before they really develop they're they're pretty good and and the shoots if eh, maybe up to eight inches high um 
you know, a really fresh tasting like asparagus or something like that. Um, and the same with the, the ferns. Um, this is actually, this fern here is not an ostrich fern. I really need to replace that. Um, some people say that you can eat any of the ferns. It all depends on your own personal makeup, but some of the other ferns are higher in tannins. And so they very much might upset your stomach. And that's something that you should take into account. Um, and then these wild leeks, which are really, really delicious. Um, and there's just some, some other things as well um, out there to keep in mind the, the different um, uh, nuts, different mushrooms. There's all kinds of mushrooms out there. And that's, that's a whole nother topic, right? Chicken of the woods and all kinds of stuff. Um, but certainly, you know, this is I'm, this is just to show you that there's you know a plethora of stuff out there. Um, one thing that you know we keep hearing in the media is about how reservations and underserved other minority areas and underserved areas are food um, deserts, but I argue that we are experiencing food apartheid instead that we have been systematically removed from the knowledge we have of all of the foods around us, all of the medicines around us because of um, boarding school era, assimilation era, all of those things. Now there is plenty, you know, there's a lot of things out there. We just need to relearn all of these things. It's there somewhere. And um, and you just gotta start somewhere, somewhere simple like dandelions, like down here at the bottom. Um, so I just wanna say miigwech. Um, these are the people that I had created this presentation with and we would present together. Um, and so I wanted to acknowledge this wasn't just all me. Um, this is a, a group effort and I thank you for listening and please um, ask me questions if you if you have any and it looks like there may be something in the chat. Thank you, Shannon, and yeah, thanks so much for what you said at the end too and it's it's all out there it's right outside our door so. Um, yeah, I know one question quick one was what's punky wood. So I, I'm guessing, you know, it's just wet, wet wood that's going to give off some, some smoke, some interesting mm -hmm. smells. Yeah. Yeah. And that's the only question I saw, at least in the chat, but if anyone has questions, feel free to put it in the chat or just unmute yourself and ask. And, um, when we're a little over time too, so I'll note that too if folks need to get going. Yeah, I apologize. I, I probably put <laughs> everybody to sleep. <laughs> Sorry. There's so many plants and there's so many ways that we can just keep them around. So, so that's the difficult thing about talking about plants. I want to talk about them all, but mm -hmm. there's too many to talk about. <laughs> Yeah, I'm the one who are like, I'm, I'll try to exercise, like go for a run or like a bike ride and I'll just end up stopping. Like, oh, who's that? Oh, who's that? <laughs> who's on the trail? So I get it. Um, okay. Any questions? I'll ask one more time. <clears throat> uh, yeah. You know, I'm not, I, hi, my name's Kat Trakowski. Um, I am Buju. I am in the, um, in Northern Wisconsin, um, near Red Cliff, uh, that's the community I serve. Not too long ago, I was on a webinar with, wait, let's turn my face on. I was on a webinar with Linda Black Elk and she was sharing that, um, and this blew my mind and I, I'm just mentioning it because the, the milkweed edibility was mentioned today. And she was sharing that um, she, will eat milkweed leaves and that will like use them as like a wrap. And I'm just curious if anyone else has heard 
that information and uh, I'm just like super because like I said it like blew my mind and I don't even really know where the idea that it was like poisonous came from um, exactly but that was just something that throughout my whole life I had heard that milkweed was poisonous but then you know as I learn more about plants and medicine it's like oh yeah you can eat the flowers you can make like a sun tea um, we can work with the pods we can work with the young plant and then I just heard that new information this year of the leaves and I, I just am curious if anyone else had heard that or um, or like resources that like are sharing uh, more information uh, more information about the toxicity of the leaves perhaps. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, they um, they actually have something in them. It's why they're called milkweed. That's actually really um, similar to latex. Um, and so maybe that's where it's one of those things. There's some people that could be highly allergic or if you eat it in abundance, it could upset your stomach. But that's really interesting, you know, and that's where I said, you know, it all depends on people's physiologies too. Some people eat all the ferns. Some people get, ex you know, stomach aches from that. Some people will eat false morels, um, but others that upsets their stomach too. And they say, absolutely, you know, stay away from those. So it, it all depends on the person as well. Miigwech, I appreciate you reiterating that as well, because I think that's a really val valid point. And it's like the plants help us to know ourselves better too, you know, and like with, with caution and, and care and time. Um, but I think that's a really good point too. Like we can come to know ourselves better and, and really get to know our bodies and what does and doesn't work, like you say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a good point too. When you it's interesting if you do try things and it gives you a certain effect that's not desirable. Another way to think about it is, well, maybe this is a good solution for something else. This is giving me TMI. This is giving me diarrhea. Well, maybe that's actually a good constipation medicine, you know, things like that. Okay. I feel like I could talk about plants forever, but yeah, a little more space if people have questions. All right. Well, thanks, Kat, for yeah, bringing in Linda. I know, yeah, she's a powerful ethnobotanist and has been really big on reconnecting people with plant relatives. Um, yeah, throughout quarantine and stuff I just saw her everywhere I feel like <laughs> and yeah it's definitely I know I was taught it's a relationship too and so like a plant might tell you something that it won't tell someone else that they won't tell someone else so anyway so thanks again Shannon Shimaguetch for sharing all your knowledge and um, thanks to all of you for being here and um, yeah we'll be back again next week for cooking as a snap but that's kind of start kicking off our summer series so be sure to register separately for the summer series where it'll be cooking as a snap and then monthly on farm classes. So yeah, with that, uh, <laughs> thanks everyone for coming. Go enjoy that 70 degree weather while it's still here. <laughs>